I don't have uh, an intro for this show because it's new. Um, we don't start this show. This is what I hate about starting new shows on this because there's no actual way to start it. So, uh, hi guys, welcome to What You're Watching with me, Jer Leggett. <laughs> You're very welcome to a brand new venture here on uh, the Page 180 podcast, uh, where every time we're going, uh, myself and uh, a friend who I'm going to introduce right now, um, we'll catch up on the things we're watching on the small screen. It doesn't have to be kind of our goal and our mission statement, I guess, in what you're watching is to give you your new fave. You're sitting at home. You're like, I've nothing to watch. There's poxy nothing on. Listen to this podcast. That's the idea. We're not going to do spoilers. We're not going to ruin anything for you. We want you to find things. And if there's shows that you're watching in general that we haven't got time to discuss in bigger shows and page 180 and like into the spoiler verse or anything like that, we'll kind of give you uh, a little bit on it and our thoughts on how they're go going on. Um, People ask me sometimes, and I was just saying before um, we, we came on the air, like, you know, do you, do you watch all this stuff because you have a podcast? And what I say to them is, no, I have a podcast because I watch all this stuff. So what you're listening to is basically just an excuse to validate the hours upon hours upon hours I've spent on my arse uh, watching stuff so I can tell myself it's valuable and I'm being a critic and it's somehow part of my job, even though it's not part of my job. Uh, joining me, another man who is uh, on the podcast because he is this way. He is the Mary to my Pippin. He is the Alfred to my Batman, the Ralph Boner to my Agatha. It is the one, the only uh, fan club's Kev Keen. You're very welcome, Kev. How are you feeling about? We've no way to start this, so again, you can. And it's your and my show, so you can kind of jump in however you like. How do you want to start your what? What you watching? Um, tenure. Um, first of all, I've got demands, Jer. Uh, okay. I want my own intro, like Dan has and a Jer has. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I want that. Uh, so I'm being very demanding here. I also, oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say, for all the hours I spent sitting on my arse, and here's another man who's also spent <laughs> hours <laughs> sitting on his arse. <laughs> Which, to be fair, is absolutely fucking true. But yeah, and, and um, we still are. We uh, still what, are. What we're doing like it right in terms now. Of, what, what would you like in terms of your intro? What are you thinking? Like, because again, like you've actually made music that I could I could use, but I feel like that's cliche um, and um, I feel like if we use it without paying you might sue us so uh, what would you like <laughs> could, for? could we the change man? the lyrics to heaven as a place on earth to Kevin as a place on earth that is definitely something we could arrange for the next time <laughs> And I don't think Belinda Carlisle is really up on the nerd culture podcast nah, scene she'd so be fine with it probably not good. well like she probably wouldn't she probably sue but she's not gonna listen and that's Hold it on. i've and got again. i've got belinda on the line here hang on a second <laughs> belinda baby yeah we're just gonna use yeah oh you already know that's cool yeah i will i'll, I'll tell him you say hi all right bye that was belinda how, yeah, how could i hi. forget uh, the great <laughs> belinda carlisle and fan club <laughs> of course you know her yeah best those of i know course. her well <laughs> Guys, today we're going to get into uh, some uh, prestige recommendations. I've got some Apple TV shows up and follow along. We're going to get into some nerd stuff as well because we're nerds. If you've ever heard us talk about stuff before, we don't. you don't need us to tell you that. Um, we're going to talk about Batman. Uh, we're getting ready for The Penguin and Agatha All Along, which are debuting this week. So we're going to talk about how we've been getting ready for them. We're also getting ready for Halloween. Kev's been uh, binging some uh, old horror movies uh, that he's going to give us some recommendations. If you're getting into the Halloween season. Going to touch on the last season of Umbrella Academy. Uh, the Rings of Power is something that I've been getting addicted to as well. So uh, we have loads to discuss. If there's something you're particularly listening for, you can check out the show notes. We're going to have all the timestamps there. Uh, and guys, there's something else. We had a bit of news today uh, because I got busy at the weekend because it's been a few weeks since we did a podcast. And I decided to just import everything we did on page 180. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to change everything. Everything will stay the same for you guys if you're subscribing. But I imported everything uh, we have on page 180 directly over to Spotify's podcast, which is much better or much worse, depending on your viewpoint. Because now you may have noticed you can see us as well as hear us. You don't have to see us um, if you don't want it. If it's repulsive to you, that's fine. Me, not Kev. Kev's a beautiful man. I think I speak for everyone there. Um, We're both beautiful, <laughs> You can now watch us. <laughs> 
on uh, however you watch your podcast. Uh, you can get transcripts as well if you have accessibility needs or that's your thing. Uh, you can also subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music and Audible if you prefer them to Spotify. So however you want us, uh, you will get us uh, one of those ways. But Kev, are you ready to get into the very simple water cooler question? What are you watching? What am I watching? Um... Let's talk Let's some see. Batman first, because there's a lot going on. I think I know and, I've I've got a list yeah. of stuff here I'm watching. Yeah, okay. Batman's a good place to start. Yeah, yeah. the Caped Crusader. Yes. What uh, What were your thoughts? Obviously released on Amazon, um, binge released as well. Uh, which is mm. always I always I don't know. We're going to talk a lot about um streaming platforms release strategies. I don't know why it's fascinating, but it is. Um, Batman Cape Crusader, obviously a takeoff. Uh, Matt Reeves who. Uh, you know, uh, directed the Batman movie and is a big part of the Penguin project that's obviously debuting this week. Um, he's kind of behind it as well. Um, and it's kind of a follow along to the animated series, but kind of goes its own way. Uh, what were your thoughts? Did you were you a big animated series watcher? Did it live up to the hype? How? Because I know you were texting me a few months ago and you're very excited about this. Did it live up? To yeah, the when hype? when when the when the trailer dropped a few months ago, uh, and I saw who was making it, and I just saw the animation style, I was like, oh. This is a gun. It's gonna be amazing. Um, it did and it didn't live up to that. Like I thought, I my biggest concern was the voice because obviously Ken, Kevin Conroy, Conroy has passed away now, mm. and I really liked Hamish Linklater as as Batman. I thought he did a really good job. I thought he was brill. Um, and so when the voice was good, I was like, okay, I can kind of settle into this. Um, a lot of it felt a little. Fillery, I think there was a couple of like standout episodes, but some of the ones in the in the middle, um, I thought were kind of a bit fillery. But for the most part, I enjoyed it. I love the setting. Um, I love Commissioner Gordon Gordon in it as well, and just the dynamics that are in it now as well. Um, yeah, I'd say it's mo- mostly positive to be honest. Okay. Um, couple, uh, yeah, there's some of the filler episodes. I was kind of like, oh, I could have kind of skipped that or left it on in the background. Mm. But yeah, for the most part, that was pretty good. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was like the Batman is something that I revisited uh, just at the weekend, actually. Um, and I was kind of meh on it originally when I saw the first in the cinema. And because it was me too, you know, I don't, it was, just wasn't the tone I was expecting. You know, it wasn't campy. It wasn't fully Nolan. It was more Nolan than campy, but it was very serious. I, it was very based on kind of you know, the Detective Batman series, uh, you know, it was very pulpy. Um, I loved it when I watched it again, by the way. When I was tuned into that frequency and ready for it, I enjoyed it so much more than I did in the cinema. And that's what this is to me. This is that pulpy Detective Batman vibe kind of, uh, again, it's no coincidence that Matt Reeve is a part of both. This is his obviously favorite flavor of Batman and I'm into it. Uh, It's inspired by kind of, 40s and 60s comic book stories where it's very villain of the week format um but there's very kind of a lot of bold revisioning of characters in here commissioner gordon for example much like uh in the batman is black uh harvey dent isn't uh the harvey dent you know from nolan's movies he's pretty much a dickhead um mm. And that was bold as well. Penguin is Oswalda Cobble, Cobblepot, um, his mother, uh, which kind of leaves it open, obviously, I presume, for Oswald and future series. Uh, and also you had like kind of uh, Selena Kyle in there. I love the casting of her, by the way. Christina Ritchie, um, again, channeling her on Hinge side, which she's honed so well recently in Yellow Jackets, if anyone's watched that. Um the fact that she's almost instantly outed as Catwoman, that's not a spoiler um, because it is instantaneous where it's like, oh, you're Catwoman. <laughs> oh, we all know who you are. <laughs> um, and then Harley Quinn is there as well. There's a lot, of, there's, they, they play a lot of the hits. There's a few arcs. Um, I thought, I, I really enjoyed this. I thought this was uh, Harley, the Harley Quinn episode, uh, the Commissioner Gordon bounty episode, uh, the a tree episode arc that kind of ended the series, uh, mainly surrounding Harvey Dent. Um, mm. I loved like that. The highs were high. I agree. There was a lot of spooky stuff. Um, but I, you know, it's 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 a thirty minute show, so you can't be too angry. You know, it's like okay, yeah, like that wasn't the best episode ever, but um, you know, I I haven't given too much of my life away to it. Um, I thought as well. I liked how Batman, and again, this is very similar to their Batman. Uh, he's in the early days of his crime fighting, which again, Batman is a limited. 
Batman should never be doing this for 50 years. It's not feasible considering he's essentially yeah. his superpower is richness. Um, <laughs> he's very mortal and he could just afford very expensive Kevlar. Um, so I like the way that he's very mortal in this. He loses quite a lot throughout the series. Like he'll lose fights, he'll, villains will get away or you can see the consequences of his actions where he hasn't necessarily thought through. Um, so I really enjoyed that aspect and, and Hamish Linklater, um, who you might know as well, if you don't know the name immediately, if you've watched Midnight Mass, uh, Mick Flanagan's amazing Netflix horror. And if you're looking for something to, to kind of binge on top of what Kev's going to uh, recommend, recommend later, yeah. uh, it is very, very good. Mm. Uh, I thought he did great as well. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, again, if you're looking for something, it's not as high as X-Men 97, but I'm, no. I am I think it it's a win. It's a net win for animated kind of television and that kind of revival. It definitely doesn't kill it. Um, so I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. So yeah, there, there, there we go. Batman Cape Crusader. Um, are you looking forward to Penguin this week? Is that uh, you were kind of met on the Batman as a whole? Is is it just something you you watch because it's Batman, or is it something that you know what? And what were your thoughts? I suppose also on Colin Farrell as the Penguin in the movie because that really will dictate. He was he thinking. was he was a bit of a standout for me for the film. I think he was absolutely real. Um, I've only seen the the movie once. I saw it in the cinema. And it was really long. I was like, oh, I don't know. It just didn't hit me. So I think I might need to go back and, and watch it again. Mm. Um, Maybe with just like a, you know, when you kind of go back and you're, maybe your expe- expectations were at some insane high level and maybe they weren't met or it just wasn't what you thought it was going to be. And then you go back and look at it fresh, with fresh eyes, kind of knowing what you're getting. And you're like, oh, shit, I appreciate the way they did that and that and that. But Colin Farrell was a standout for me and I'm excited to see what he does because he's just incredible anyway as, a, as an actor in general um mm. i don't i've only seen one trailer for it i think i don't really know a massive amount of what the series is actually going to entail but like i'm intrigued it's a hbo show um i'm gonna watch it like it's it, it looks from what i've seen of it just um i don't know like it's just a good crime show and hbo are known for very good crime shows <laughs> yeah they get um, it yeah yeah so uh i might go back and watch the batman then before it as well i think maybe this mm. week um, I, i'd recommend and and colin farrell actually i didn't like him he was one of the things know? i actually didn't like in the penguin and it wasn't that i thought he did badly it's just that i just wasn't ready for it i like i kind of wasn't ready for any of it and I'm like, that's Colin Farrell. And it just took me out every time. It's like when I watch uh, Peaky Blinders is a show I never got into. And <sighs> I know, I know. And that's me. That's 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 on me. I don't, I'm not saying it's a bad show. But I watched it the entire time going, Killian Murphy, you don't speak that way. You know what I mean? And I'm like, Tom Hardy, what are you doing? Like, you know, I just couldn't. The accents just, and, and everything else around it. And that's, I think, what took me out of it. But when I watched it again this week, I loved him in it. I loved him. I got it. Yeah. It clicked. Um, and has me really excited for this kind of gritty crime drama. And that's kind of what they have where it's made to be a HBO type show um, set in the Batman world. So again, I don't know that much about it, but I'm looking forward to it. I'd love to do a catch up. I think we might uh, see if we can get Dan involved mm. in that and we'll do a spoilery chat on it uh, kind of towards the end, but very excited. Another thing, I don't know if I'm excited for it because they've kind of ruined it is um, I got all along debuts this week and I took time to kind of go back and revisit one division and multiverse of madness over the past few weeks to kind of get in that mode and for me one division still to this day stands as the best marvel tv show they've done and by a considerable distance loki is quite good i enjoyed it um but I thought the first season hemmed and hawed and it was uneven. And then the second season pulled it all together. But I can't turn around and say you're better than One Division. But One Division is perfect to me, except for the last episode when it became a generic Marvel movie. But even then, the last episode, when you rewatch it and you know the shit bits, you're like, yeah, okay, that's fine. I know it's shit. But the, the highs are still high. Like Wanda and Vision saying goodbye to each other and stuff like that as well. Um, It's the best TV show by a mile. But then the flip side of that was I hadn't seen Multiverse of Madness since it was released in the cinema because I loved WandaVision so much and I fucking hated what they did. Like, and and watching them so closely together, watching them one after the other this time made me mad again. <laughs> it really fucking <laughs> triggered me. 
like multiverse of madness compared to one division it is like your mate whose favorite song is the dart song who was constantly you know he's constantly it is that it is that guy writing a sequel to one division you know you've got this perfect bit of like kind of uh, genre storytelling. And then all of a sudden you have like a fucking oaf coming in and watching it. It's stylishly made. There's some cool bits. Sam Raimi is Sam Raimi, but Sam Raimi also didn't watch WandaVision and it shows it's offensively bad. I did um, not know that. That yeah. he didn't watch it at all. Okay. That, that makes a lot of wild. sense now. Mm. How do you make a sequel to something if you haven't watched it? Like Elizabeth Olsen tries, but like, and she does capture Wanda at certain points in it, but it's not the same character and it's not the same story. And it's such a betrayal of what was such a complex and nuanced arc that they took us on in one division to have her just be like, yeah, she's bad. And they, tr- and people, they'll turn around and say, yeah, but the dark hold and this and that and the other, that made her bad. And actually she's the same person, but she's been corrupted and this and that. Bollocks. They literally just at the start, they're like, we're just going to make her evil. And actually they'd taken such time in one division to explore things from her side. And they're like, yeah, right. Okay. There's that side. But what if she was just a bit of a cunt? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, that's, and that's the angle that multiverse of madness attacks it from. Um, there are cool bits. Look, you've got Reed Richards in there. You've got the cameos and stuff like that, like Xavier and stuff like that. It, you, you know, you, it, there's interesting bits, but um, it didn't How, work look, for me. And I'm worried about Agatha all along as a result. It seems through the ads that it's kind of going back to the WandaVision vibe. Um, I'm a big fan of anything with Aubrey Plaza in it. I'm very happy to be getting more of her. Um but I'm nervous about this as someone who loved one of it. I'm like, you've pissed all over something I love already. Stop pissing. And I really hope they don't piss again because it will piss me off even more. I've said piss a lot, Kev. <laughs> How are you feeling about uh, Agatha all along? Are you looking forward to it? Um, I am. Um, I do love Aubrey Plaza as well, but I'm I'm such a massive fan of Catherine Hahn as well. I think she's mm. unreal. Like everything she's in, she usually makes the movie better. She's one of those character actors. I love her in, in nearly everything she's in. She's brilliant. And I think her getting a bit of time to, like even in WandaVision, she was just brilliant. Every every episode she was in, you're always looking forward to her. Um, I hope they get it right because I completely agree with you as well about, and I'm super surprised. I didn't know that, that he'd never seen any of WandaVision. Mm. And considering Disney are so picky with directors and being like, you can't do this because we've got this vision kind of thing. No, no pun intended. We've got this vision of stuff going on for the future. And that just seems to be one of the biggest missteps that they've ever done by allowing them to be like, yeah, I'll just do whatever the fuck I want really with this character. Um, And yeah, they completely pissed all over it, as you said. Good use of the word piss. But um, yeah, I guess I, I, I'm really doing my best to not watch trailers for stuff anymore. I've seen the first teaser trailer of it and that's all I want. Um, The cast is good and I'm hoping it will be as good as WandaVision. Like Loki is, I know you said WandaVision was your favorite. Loki is my, as we said though, as watching season one and two together, I think is is my number one. But yeah, WandaVision is a very close second though as well. Um, And yeah, I think... I think just how Aubrey Plaza and Catherine Hahn together will be a, a, a must see. I think at least every week. Anyway, it at least if the story's shit, at least they'll be entertaining. Mm. That's that's because like once again, my faith in crazy high in Disney. And like we were saying as well with the Deadpool cameos, and like with with the multiverse of madness. Like once you've seen them once, they lose a lot of their their wow factor, and you're like, oh yeah, that's them. Cool. Yeah. The story still shit though. <laughs> mm. This isn't distracting from the story anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the one thing. Yeah, I think you're right. And you know what? Like ultimately, I am quietly optimistic that this could be quite good. Um, what I'd like to see is it mattering. I don't want to see it go down like um secret invasion where it's like no one was impacted by anything that happened here. You know, and you've wasted your life watching this. Um. 
or have it be a fun indulgence. Like I'd like it to have stakes here. I'd like it to have big picture stakes. There's a vision TV show in the works, and they're starting to make announcements about that. They announced a showrunner this week, Paul Bettany's coming back. Um, and that'll obviously tailor from the end of uh White Vision's arc that we saw a Wonder like in the One Division series. So I'd be interested to see if we see any Wanda in this because mm. while it seems to her end seem very definite in Multiverse of Madness, we know that's you know, you can go back on that. And yeah. I, I, I think they need to. And I think they need to kind of go back to somewhere here. There's a lot of call outs and hints that not that Wanda's going to be in it, but just she's going to be referenced in this show in the trailer. Um, And ultimately, if you remember how we left her with WandaVision, like essentially Agatha is under Wanda's spell. So what happens now when that spell is broken? And I think that's going to set everything into motion here. So, um, I'd like there to be a big picture. I'd like to kind of, because I don't know what the Vision TV show is going to be. And now I'm back interested in this, having rewatched one Vision again. Um, and I don't want it to be just Vision goes on an, a new adventure every week and comes across a bad guy and beats him. I wanted to play into that long term storyline because I think mm. there's legs there. Um, are you are you excited about the fact that it's an Agatha TV show? Like I, for me, I'm more excited about the actors that are in it yeah. rather than the character i think yeah. and that's why i'm i'm not a crazy crazy excited about it but i'm gonna watch it like anyway but i'm hoping to be like oh this is going to set up something bigger down the line but it's it's a it's a really strange it's one of those ones that kind of got out from when disney announced tons of stuff and then had to be like oh actually no we we're, we're not going to do a lot of that yeah and it's one of the ones that got through so i'm hoping maybe it will matter that's the reason it got through um, I'm very much in the same mind as you. I'm interested because of the talent in it, you yeah. know, and the potential, the potential and the fact that it's like, if you can carry the vibe from one division over, but also as soon as Catherine Han was a massive highlight of that show, but as soon as she was unveiled as Agatha all along, the show kind of went a bit downhill, say for that one kind of flashback episode she had with Wanda, which is mm. brilliant. Um, but I, I don't think they captured our imagination with Agatha as a character and who she can be and what her powers are and this and that. The idea is she can just steal other people's powers. And I'm like, yo, it's not really cool. Um, but <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, I'm very much saying mine, but I'm I'm going into it with an open mind. I want to love this and I, I'll see how it goes. Mm. Um, another show I want to love and we'll kind of stick with nerd culture for the time being is... Um, you haven't we only talk about this during the week. You haven't watched The Rings of Power yet, have you not? And I know you're a Lord of the Rings fan. It's such a strange thing because Lord of the Rings was only on over the weekend. And it's one of those Lord of the Rings is a trilogy where if that's on TV, no matter what movie it is or what part it's on, if I flick over onto it, I'm gone for the rest for the rest yeah. of the film. Like I have to watch the whole thing. Um I watched the first episode of Rings of Power it was a good bit after it came out, and I think. I don't know. I just I watched it. I was like, that was fine. I might watch the next one. And I just never went back to it. I just mm. it didn't catch me. Okay. Um and is 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 it good? I, I sell me on on the rings of power. Okay, I will. Um <laughs> if you are that into Lord of the Rings, I not only say that I would advise you to watch The Rings of Power. I would say that it is damn near essential to watching The Rings uh, to what to to follow it along. Okay, um, do you know the the pitch from it? Do you know the general idea of what the concept is? I presume it's it's Sauron making the Rings of Power, is it? Yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's... So it's it's the story. Of, it's the Rings of Power Inception story and Sauron's kind of rise. It's um. A filling out, I suppose, but also a condensing of the stories from the the kind of epilogue of the Lord of the Rings with a lot of the Cimmerillion kind of uh, mm. history. If you've ever read any of that from Tolkien thrown in, um, when it comes to nerd culture, okay, I'd say you know when it comes to the likes of Game of Thrones or Harry Potter, I'd be at a ten, you know, uh. Then you've got Star Wars, probably nine, Marvel, seven, Lord of the Rings. I would have always been maybe a five or six. Like it, love it, watch the movies, into it. I've read all the books, I've listened to the audio books. So I'm, I'm not, not a Lord of the Rings nerd, but it just has never been my thing. Rings of Power has made it my thing. 
okay? And I'm not saying that, that like, I'm probably a seven or eight now with it, okay? And I, I will probably go up to 10 because it's causing me to do so much research. That's not to say that it's better than the movies. It's not, okay? Um, There are a lot of things that if you're very um protective over Lord of the Rings canon, will probably anger you or at least cause questions. Do you know what I mean? But the, the creators of this show deeply, deeply care about Lord of the Rings canon. They want to tell that story. They're just in the unenviable position of trying to tell sto a story that lasts for thousands of years throughout the course of, you know, and they have to condense mm. that down into a, a compelling narrative. Um, There's a lot of characters in it that, you know, we know and a lot of places we know. For example, you have Galadriel, you have Elrond, um, you have obviously Sauron, but you have a more human form of Sauron. Um, it it kind of goes back to, you know, he's a shapeshifter, but he's shapeshifting into kind of, you know, people that can talk, people that can be played by an actor is, 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 is as far <laughs> as I'll get without kind of wanting to give anything away. Um, you know, there's, there's hints of potentially the likes of Gandalf might be in this. Saruman might be in this. We don't know. There's people that are like, is that, is that Gandalf? Is that Saruman? Is that who is that that person? And like you're kind of left wondering with it. But this, what I love about the Rings of Power, and I loved it even more in a first watch, a second watch, or sorry, on a second watch. The first watch, I was a bit like, okay, okay, I'm just trying to take it all in, trying to keep up with the research and the little references and Easter eggs. Um, but then when I watched it the second time around in preparation for this, I'm like, I fucking love this show because it gets it. It gets the little things that like real token fans will love. It gets the aspect of fellowship and the fact that there should be joyful, gleeful, funny moments between these characters, moments that make you fall in love with these characters and the relationships they have. It, it There's a joyous celebration of the concept of fellowship in this. Um, you have, uh, you know, big conversations around the likes of, you know, the, the the nature of evil and what corrupts us as people and when are we corrupted. Gladriel's story in particular is very interesting in terms of deconstructing Gladriel as a character. Um, it challenges people. And that's where a lot of people don't like it because it challenges a lot of our preconceived notions about a lot of characters. Um but it like you know there there there's people like any scene in Kaza done I'm just smiling um, yeah. I'm just like yes this is me this is it all over it's made me go back and explore the canon a lot more because I want to be in and Lord of the Rings as a TV show just works because you have that week to week bit of nerd out stuff where you're like I want to learn everything about that one character we just saw or where's that history or that reference we got there um the most recent episode. And, and, and kind of this season, season two, where season one was very much like kind of just about introducing the world, introducing the characters, introducing the stakes. Season two now has kind of got a bit confident because season one did so well. Um, and, and season one had no real right to do well because it's such a nerdy story. It's so deep in the mythology of it all. There's references that they just throw away that you're like, that's actually huge. Or that's that character. And that character is mentioned in for 10 seconds, but importantly, at the start of the first movie, you know what I mean? So there's little stuff like that that you'll get addicted to as you kind of go on, especially coming from someone who's seen the first movie so many times because there's just like, that name, what's that name? They spoke about them in the movies. What the fuck? Who is that person? Oh my God, they're them? Um, there's loads of that. Uh, there's loads of musical bits in it as well. Um, season two has started to introduce kind of a horror element to it as well, which I mean... is really refreshing <laughs> for Lord of the Rings. Um, every week there seems to be a horror element. There seems to be like, they've, they've been doing surprise deaths this season of big characters and almost Game of Thrones way like at random points where you're not expecting it and I'm like this show seems to have teeth but it's very much also not Game of Thrones and not trying to be Game of Thrones it's not trying to be adult it's not trying to be sexy it is very much Lord of the Rings it's very much nerdy and you know cute and campy at times uh, there's musical interludes in it because music is so embedded in kind of token folklore Um. I really recommend it if you're into it, but you have to go into it with an open mind and you have to go into it not too precious about, you need to honor everything that Tolkien said because that's not how Tolkien felt about his world. He wanted to create a play, a play uh, pen with toys where everyone could go in and play with it. That's how he likes his work. And they've very much done that, but not in a way that spoils everything because you always get the sense that if anything, they're 
too big of fans. They're getting too nerdy. Like it is so nerdy at times. You're like, there is not like, how are Amazon spending hundreds of millions on this when it feels like it's made just for me? You know, <laughs> it feels that way. Um, but I don't mind it. It's like, it, it's brilliant that it exists. It's getting a lot of shit. I feel that's really unfair. I feel that is kind of the toxic fan culture element rather than it deserves it. Not to take away people's right to dislike it or disagree with me, but I really recommend The Rings of Power. If you like Lord of the Rings, I'd say you not only should watch it, you need to watch it. And and make up your own mind and see how it goes. But they've some interesting things to say. They get it and they're big fans. So, yeah, I'd recommend. Um, so I want to get to now that I know you've been watching and I haven't. And the reason I haven't watched it is because, I, I don't know if you know this actually, because we haven't spoken about it. You know this show got cancelled after one season? Um, I do on HBO but, and Netflix have picked it up and it might get yes, a season two now. It might get a season two. And that was mm. the one thing that put me off because I heard amazing things. It's controversial. I reckon it'll get a season two because there's such an angry fan backlash to it. Um, Getting cancelled because the people that like this show fucking love it. So yeah. sell me on Scavenger's Reign, another animated one. Yeah, this is what... So I first kind of even heard about this kind of through a different show. Um, a comic on this year, there was a show called um, Common Side Effects. That was a trailer for it. I think I put it up in the group chat. I was like, this show looks fucking amazing. It's not, it's not until next year. But it's made by these two guys, Joseph Bennett and Steve Healy. Um, and so this is it's, uh, kind of a conspiracy show about Big Pharma and the government trying to hide this rare fucking fungus that can cure all diseases. Um, and then there's like an FBI kind of element in it as well of these two, <laughs> these two uh, FBI agents who don't seem like amazing at their jobs, but the name is Capano and Harrington. And you get to know everything about their personality through a song and dance number in the trailer. And you're like, I'm fucking in with them. And I just, I just absolutely adore the trailer. But I just looked up what else Joseph Bennett um, and see what Keely might have done. And so I looked up Joseph Bennett and people were talking about Scavenger's Reign. Check it out. And just saw it was on Netflix and decided, screw it, I'll give it a go. Um, Scavenger's Reign is a very different show. It's a very serious sci-fi show about um, a cargo ship um, that gets damaged um, while they're they're bringing a cargo back. Um, and then they get stranded on this planet called Vesta. Um, and this planet is kind of... The best way I can kind of describe it is, do you remember like the, have you ever seen like Peter Jackson's King Kong? Yes. Do you know some of like the 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 way the fauna and the animals are in that where, do you remember that one horrific scene where they get like eaten by the worms and mm. it's just pure silence. It's one of the most horrific scenes in movie history to me because it's just silence and people screaming and it's just hopelessness. Some of the fauna in this is kind of like that it's like incredibly like just dangerous and you were like it's humans are not the the apex predators on this place as well and it's about three groups of survivors trying to get back to one particular point for the whole series um so you got azzy and her robot levi or levi you got sam and ursula and sam was the captain of the ship and you got this other guy came in and they're all trying to get back so each episode might kind of uh be be one of these three uh one of yeah one of the three groups stories um they're really really interesting um characters but like the best thing about it is the animation the creativity of the fauna that is the, on this planet and how they use some of the fauna to help them i've just never seen anything like this in a tv show before in terms of if you're into I guess like Studio Ghibli maybe in a way, but it's mm. a completely different thing from that as well. It's the it's just so creative and bleak and scary at times as well. But it's um it's some if you're into sci-fi, I cannot recommend this enough. Um, writing is on point, and it does like it could it is open a little bit for a season two at the end, but at the same time, if it did get cancelled, there's enough of an ending there that you're like, yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's that's okay. an ending. Well, when you say Studio Ghibli, are like I, can't, I know what you mean, and I love a bit of Ghibli myself. But like, you mean kind of adult orientated kind of anime that type, that direction? Would that be what where you mean yeah. by that comparison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's definitely um, a mature 
audience show. Okay. 100%. Okay. Yeah. It's and- it's pretty horrific at times. <laughs> Okay. Okay. But, interesting. But you're but you're so enthralled by the animation and the story. Like some of the stuff is just bleak. Um, but you you have to be like, oh, I have to watch the next episode. It's so good. Uh, <laughs> How many episodes? Gorgeous, Ten, is gorgeous, it? gorgeous score. Um, it's twelve episodes. Okay. Okay. So not roughly... obscene like an anime show. I remember I was I, I went in a few dates with a girl and she was a massive anime fan. And like I like a bit. I dabble. You know. Mm. Um. I love, like I said, Studio Ghibli and stuff like that as well. But like, she she turned around. She's, I'm like, okay, well, I'm I'm happy for you to give me recommendations because I'm open to it. I just don't know where to dive in. And she's like, okay, so there's this one show. There's like only a thousand episodes. So I'm like, no, I'm not gonna start yeah. with the show with a thousand episodes. I need <laughs> to watch everything once I commit. <laughs> but so twelve, I can commit to half hour, an hour. What's there and. 30 to 40 minutes ish. Um, okay. Per episode. Netflix. So I imagine they let whatever they give it the space to tell the time. For yeah. Time. Sometimes some, it kind of varies, I think, per, per, per episode. Okay. But uh, I would, it's like, it's, it's my favorite show this year. Even though it was like Ooh. technically the end of last year, but it's, it's up there. Maybe it's definitely top three anyway. And I would okay. say. It's mad. Like some of my, my top TV shows at the moment are like 40. Don't be spoiling year. it. Don't be spoiling it. We're going to so do an far. end of year. <laughs> <laughs> but X, X-Men and Scavengers Reign are up there for me. Okay. Um, okay. Amazing. Good stuff. Yeah. They're both animated shows. But yeah, big old recommend. Love it. Love it. Okay. Interesting. Right. You've 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 sold me on. Do you know what I might do? I might make it. I might add it to my Christmas watch list because I love to just binge the shit out of mm. things when I'm vegging at Christmas. So I think that might be uh, on the list because I love like a show that I'm like, this is A1. Uh, like a couple of years ago, it was White Lotus. Uh, last year, I did Only Murders in the Building, which was disappointed. Like it, not that it's bad and they've actually got a new season. I've accidentally segued myself into something I wasn't going to talk about. Um, <laughs> but it's fine. I, I'm not huge on it. I, I'm like, I it's grand. I actually prefer watching one a week because it means I only have to devote 40 minutes and I'm like, oh, okay, I can appreciate Steve Martin and Martin Short a bit more. Um, But it wasn't a knockout like I was hoping for. So I think Scavenger's Reign, I've heard enough good things from enough people like yourself, and now yourself uh, that I respect. I wasn't differentiating that I respect you there, but hey, I'm adding you to that. I wasn't saying people I respect and you. I was saying <laughs> you are included in the people I respect. <laughs> but um, yeah, like... Uh, so, I, yeah. I will say it's it's probably not great Christmas viewing, to be honest, but... But that's yeah. what I, I don't want. Like once Christmas, it. once the twenty fifth hits, once it's Christmas night, like all bets are off. I will watch fucking anything, you know. Yeah. I don't have to feel. I don't have to feel like the Coca Cola tr- truck can come in at any second. Once December twenty fifth hits, I'm like, right, we're over it now. We're moving on. Give me the good shit, you know. So, You're into the Gooch of Christmas or that weird fucking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I'll fucking watch it when we're in the Gooch. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Hit, hit, hit me. That's hit a me. quote Just... for the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, also on Netflix, this one did definitively finish up. Uh, Umbrella Academy had its last season. Did you watch Umbrella Academy? Did you give it a go? Or I watched season one. Uh, I was a massive. In fact, I think I have it here. Did I? I do. There we go. Oh. My my green screen. I have the I have the comic. <laughs> nice. Um, I only watched season one of it because I'm a huge My Chemical Romance fan and Jared Way fan. So um, yeah, I I I love it. But um, I've only yeah, it's only season one I've seen. you probably um, best. Probably best, if I'm being honest. Mm. Uh, season one, because they, they went their own way because they kind of ran out of roads in terms of adapting it. Uh, I don't know. I haven't read the comic, but I know at a certain stage they were like, right, we'll tell our own stories with these characters now. Okay. And th- it's been a few years. I think 2022 was the last one. And I was sure that that show had ended. It was one of those where I'm like, I definitely saw, like, I was not expecting... I was not waiting for this show to come back. Uh, and I honestly couldn't remember because the show got so fucked and complicated in the way that it told. Because it's not like if you never watched the Umbrella Academy, you're probably fine because if you if you were into it, you'd know about it uh, mm. by now and be able to at least make a choice. But if you never watched it, it's basically uh, 
family of superheroes. They're not really family, but it's like an eccentric billionaire um, adopts superheroes who are all uh, born with powers and kind of makes them into a kind of a, a makeshift dysfunctional family. And then they're able to time travel and it becomes essentially a time travel show then um, as a result of it. Um, and it's very zany. Like you've got some good casting in it. Like you've got um, Robert Sheehan, uh, who I love, love, hate, misfits. Obviously it's his big break in terms of the world stage so um delighted to see him here and he's excellent as Klaus in this it's a perfectly cast role um there's a lot of likable characters and there's a lot of fun here and on a minute to minute it's never awful because the characters are engaging and it is very light in tone they're never trying to they are always trying to save the world but it never feels like they're trying to save the world like it's so deep and dark or anything it's all very just funny it's kind of half comedy um but to me, I was just like, I when it came back, I was like, I was sure the show ended. I cannot be arsed going back and even watching the last episode because all I remember is season three was thinking, this show's lost it. It's become a mess. They came back for a condensed last season, I suppose, just to put a button on it and to give it an ending. Um, And it, it's fine. It is the show you remember it as. Don't go out of your way. If you stopped watching it like Kev, I don't recommend you go back and watch season two, three, four. Season one was quite good. Um, and then they made it messy and it just never got back up to those heights. Um, so you probably won the Umbrella Academy game uh yourself by I enjoying do, the comic. I do remember season one being good and like I do like the comics, but yeah, I, I think it was just busy or just never got around to watching that, but it never kind of drew me in again for to kind of watch anymore and like yourself i actually thought it had ended a few years ago as well <laughs> yeah yeah and and and, oh, and it, it definitely is an ending like they're not coming back um for more with the way that they ended it like so it's definitive and it's like again if you're really into these characters i want to try catch up i watched one of those things that netflix put out you know when they put it out the week of the show's release like catch up with catch blah up. blah yeah, a little yeah. feature uh, but it was interviews with the cast and they're like I'm so emotional to be letting these characters go. And I'm like, I didn't feel this was the type of show that people cared about enough to make this kind of it. You know what I mean? You know, like when Game of Thrones actors were like, I can't believe Jon Snow. It's the last mm. we'll ever see him and stuff like that. They're kind of talking about the characters in the same way. And I'm like, I don't care. Enough. Do people care about this? Do people give a shit? Like, like they're talking about like the fans. Romance fans do. They absolutely yeah, do. Yeah. yeah, they do. They do. Okay. <laughs> Katie Harvey will cry her eyes out watching this. And I've told her that. I'm like, you'll cry. No one else will. Um, you'll like it. I didn't. And I think the rest of the world is on my side. But again, yeah, if you are, if you enjoyed it, you'll enjoy it because it is what it is. And it's probably more, um, it probably makes more sense than a lot of other episodes. They also look, there's some good cast in it. They have like um, Nick Offerman and Megan Mullally. And they start as a couple together. So, like, I'm in. As soon as they showed up, I'm like, yes, they're great. If you watch them in Parks and Rec, um, yeah. you know, they're great together. They're a natural couple who have chemistry on screen. Um, So they're fantastic in this. And, again, there's a lot to like about it. But just, is it worth your time? Is it worth devoting time to it? Is it worth binging? No. If you, if, if you probably watched it if you're into it. And if you're not into it, don't make time for it. Stuff you should make time for, though, is, do you have an Apple TV subscription? I do. Um, are you watching anything on Apple TV right now? No, it's it's one of those ones I was just kind of I never actually go into it to be honest. I really should because I fucking pay for it. Like there, yeah, and 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 it's the type of thing where they're very much we curate curate content. We don't release. They're not Netflix. They're not like we'll release anything to release something new every day. I'm not telling you it's going to be good, but it's going to exist and be released <laughs> by us. <laughs> Apple TV are like, we're you're gonna keep paying for this, or probably not, because there's so many ways of getting free Apple TV. Just buy any Apple product and they'll just give you yeah. six months. And they're like, we're not gonna release something every week, but we're going when we release it, it's going to be good. Um, and then they have these periods where it's no value for money because you're not watching anything. And they have this period where it's mad value for money. Now is a good time to get into it. Okay. You've got two shows that I'm watching that are going to probably be when we do the top 10, I'd be shocked if they didn't end up here. They're mid season now. Um, they're fantastic. And they're both like kind of follow on series from a uh, series that I've loved before. Um, on top of these two shows though, then you've got silo season two, which I'd recommend. I'd say, did you watch season one? No. 
Silo season one's good. It's a sci-fi. Uh, it's uh, like based on a book. Wall. Um, if you ever heard of it, it's got a, a very cult following. Um, it's you. You'd enjoy it if you like sci-fi and you want to get stuck into something new. Um, Silo is something I feel like we'll be discussing more. Then you've got the new series of Severance coming up as well, and that was my favorite show of the year a couple of years back. Severance was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. The two shows that I'm watching right now are recommend, and this is like real TV. None of that nerd shit now. There, this is the real stuff. Um, <laughs> first up, I want to talk about Pachinko. Ever heard of it? No. Gem, absolute gem. If you're into Asian storytelling, um, this is phenomenally made television. It's not that complex. It doesn't move mountains. It's very simple and straightforward in terms of the story it's telling. Basically, it takes place over two timelines. In the main timeline, in kind of nineteen, the late 1980s, uh, we follow a Korean immigrant who was raised in Japan and then uh, moved to America and now has become this high kind of uh, Wall Street type, um, is sent back to Japan to negotiate with a Korean immigrant there, um, trying to get her to sell her land because they want to build on it basically and she doesn't want to give it up and that's kind of the 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 idea through that we then learn how koreans are treated and regarded in japan fun fact about japan i don't know if i've ever mentioned but i've been there um fun fact about japan is that um lovely people if you can ignore the fact they're a little bit racist, okay? Now, they're better today than they were. They just, they're they are a bit like the French in that they expect you to make the effort. And if you don't make the effort, they're not making the effort with you, okay? That's Japan in the 21st century. They weren't always that way. They were very, like, again, World War II, particular low point for uh, hmm. Japanese nationalism. Um but even then, like they're very much like they're they're very nationalistic, they're very proud of their heritage, and they're very protective of it as well. Um, but that has meant that they've kind of got a dark, murky history in some ways, and they persecuted people. And this tells the story of how they kind of persecuted Korean immigrants uh, and looked down upon them. And then you go back into his grandmother's story, which kind of has touch points, an almost Forrest Gump-like story that has touch points upon history of Korea and Japan. Um, and you see her story of how she ended up going to Japan and then how she was treated and made a life there. Um really basic concepts and it's one of these that like i almost overthought it in season one it's season two is out now um because i'm like what is this all building towards what's that and i'm like no it's one of these shows where you have to retrain how you think of it because if you watch nerd culture shows you're like oh do i need to remember that is that an easter mm -hmm. egg is this that it's not one of those shows it's sit back and watch a story being beautifully told and just enjoy it it's going to take you on a ride. You're not going to guess where it's going. There's going to be twists. There's going to be heartbreak. There's, you're going to cry at times. You're going to laugh at times. Um, but just sit back and enjoy a story told phenomenally. Um, the one problem with season one that I felt was, and you may experience this if you watch it, it's not very accessible. Like, again, there's, it's very hard for us to be able to relate to Koreans living in Japan. It's just so many degrees from our culture that again yeah. it's hard to emotionally feel that beyond just loving the characters and they write the characters very well and get you there as best they can but it's not as accessible they've gone beyond the source material now similar to what i was just saying about umbrella academy but it's really working because they've addressed that lack of accessibility and now the flashback series is set squarely in the middle of world war ii and like how like the Americans started to invade and it's heading very much towards the bad end of World War II for Japan. And yeah. there's little things like, you know, there's little kind of references and nods and it's not too obvious or anything like that, but there's little references where there's planes flying over and it's like, don't worry, they're not heading for Na Nagasaki. Your family's going to be fine. And you're like, oh God, the family's in Nagasaki. Oh, mm. fuck. Oh, okay. fuck. You know, there's there's stuff like that where you're like, you know that it's there's looming danger, but then there's this beautiful scene that's kind of happening, this beautiful story being told. It is brilliant TV. It is just fucking good television. You know when you try to describe the bear to people and you're trying to just explain it to them and you just have to stop and go, just it's fucking great. Just watch it. Just watch <laughs> it, yeah. 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 That Pachinko, I really recommend. Another one from Apple, if you're looking for something more accessible to watch, uh, Slow Horses. Have you ever checked it out? I've not, but I've been recommended by a ton of people to watch Slow Horses. It is arguably... It's Gary Oldman, isn't it? 
Gary Oldman. Yeah. It's written by Will Smith, not him, the other one. Um, and <laughs> Will Smith, actually, you might know, uh, was one of the writers on Veep. Um, it is uh, if Apple TV made kind of a British ITV Sunday night detective drama that's really good. Okay, so yeah. it has a lot of those staples, but it's Apple TV, so they have amazing actors. They have amazing talent. Gary Oldman as Jackson Lamb is iconic. Uh, Jackson Lamb is a kind of um, haggard, unwashed, um, rough around the edges, but genius kind of detective who runs uh, kind of the, the rejects of MI5. So people that have fucked up, or ruin their career or burn their bridges, but they can't sack, get sent to his division. And okay. they get all the shit jobs as a result. There's, it's in its fourth season now. And what the show does really well is that every season is a different type of detective story. So season one's very mystery based. Season two is kind of, uh, there's a big fuck off catastrophe on the way and they have to stop it. Season three is action, action, action. And season four is going a bit back to mystery now. It's only a couple of episodes in, um, but it's much more delicious mystery. It's a bit of a conspiracy type thing. So they genre hop throughout it, but the car- what makes Slow Horses amazing is not only that it looks and feels amazing and expensive, but is the character interplay. The characters in it are fucking phenomenal the uh, chemistry they have the banter they have it is as funny as any show on uh television and clever funny as well like succession funny you know mm. where you're like i think this is a little bit of a comedy like it's not <laughs> it's very like the way succession is like it's very much not it's very serious in some respects but that was fucking funny um that's and like the just, bear a little bit as well, though, isn't it? Is the bear yeah. should be a drama, but then it's really funny as well. And this is like a, a like a gripping detective series, like the type you would have watched in like the nineties or nineties, and you'd have been like, "That was fucking brilliant! I really got into that." But then you've forgotten about it a week later. But yeah. this is like the prestige TV version of that with A list actors, um, and like just fucking showing off they've got like a harry potter style who's who of uh english actors here and it's just fucking brilliantly told it's gonna be like top five by the end of the year i'd say um they knock it out of the park every time the series never goes wrong it never lets you down it never slips it never dips in quality it's just always a fucking treat and it's one of those series that you can just look forward to you're like i've got an episode of slow horse but you know what it's because it's so fun it never feels like a slog. It's like, oh, I have to put aside an hour. It feels like a treat. I've got an hour of slow horses to watch this week. I'm lucky enough to watch it. Cannot recommend it enough. Slow horses, if you're looking for something to watch. Uh, Pachinko might be a bit more hit and miss, but um, slow horses, you cannot go wrong. But two excellent. If you haven't got the Apple TV subscription, get it now. It's uh, it's well worth it. Um. You, while you haven't been making use of your Apple TV subscription, though, you have been Mm -hmm. making use and getting ready for Halloween of your Amazon Prime uh, subscription. Yeah. Getting into some horror movies, I believe. Yeah. um, Just I'm I'm such a big horror movie fan. And then, I don't know, as soon as the the evening started getting a little bit darker, I was kind of just getting in the mood for something. Um, I have some of these are actually Netflix as well. I'm I'm, I'm not going to like give reviews or anything on them, them, but... um, I will go, I think. I, I'm looking for, I like, I, I'm in that mode now. Like, I'm, I'm a big autumn fan. I love when the weather changes. I love when it gets colder. I love when they re- get to start wearing hoodies. And, yeah. you know, it gets darker. And now I'm like, now I'm looking forward to like Halloween and Christmas. So I'm in that mode of wanting to get my Halloween horror list. And I want mm. some sto- some gems that I haven't seen before. So hit, hit me with your recommendations. So for some, for some gems, the first one... Um... I would say is is one called The Void. Mm. Um, I've never heard of it before. I was just on the horror section on Amazon Prime and I was kind of just flick and flick and flick and and I just it's the the thumbnail just got me and it was a uh, <laughs> usually I do try and find like at 18s because you're like, all right, let's give you something a bit like fucking weird and out there here. Um so I got the void and honestly, this is not it's not amazingly acted if I'm being honest, but the story is if you're into any kind of like HP Lovecraft stuff. Um, so kind of that cosmic horror um, where like a lot of his stuff was like 
anything like the, some of the horrors are so unimaginable it just makes you go insane okay. um so the void it's a uh, bunch of people they're trapped in a hospital they are surrounded the ho- they can't leave the hospital because it's surrounded by these road figures which attack on site and they have to kind of keep the, the hospital the corridors the stairwells keep on changing in the hospital and as they're exploring more of the hospital it's affecting them and what they eventually find in the hospital is some of the most fucked up shit I've ever seen in my life. Nice. But in in terms of more, it's more so fucked up in terms of the this fuck all CGI in it. It's mostly um, practical effects, and it's some of the best practical effects I've ever seen in a in a movie. It's everything yeah. I wanted. Welcome to Raccoon City, that Resident Evil movie, to be in terms of its practical effects and just how creative I think it is as well. I love when horror movies get really, really creative with those kind of effects. And then I found out it was like done for 85 grand by this Canadian production company. Ooh. Um, and it's it's fucking great. Now, I will say if they had gotten some better actors, this movie I think would have done much better than it did. Um, The acting is not amazing in it. But if you're a horror fan, if you're a fan of like 80s horror um, and some of the body horror kind of stuff as well, huge, huge recommend. Um. And then after that, I kind of got into, I was like, what else is like, a, well, Amazon Prime actually recommended this to me, mostly because it's, it's actually a H.P. Lovecraft story called The Color Out of Space. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the stars Nicolas Cage, so it's a bit more of a high budget one. I mean, um, it's about a meteorite that crashes down onto the farm that Nicolas Cage and his family are in. It starts radiating um, all this kind of bizarre energy. It starts changing some of the environments around it and infecting people. And once again, uh, this is more of a cosmic kind of horror. A lot of the stuff that's in it that's horrifying, you don't see. It's in your your imagination. Um, but the one thing you do see is one of the most fucked up things I've seen in a horror film in a long time as well. Okay. Um, this is Some of this is more body horror kind of stuff as well. I don't know if like it's more like the Cronenberg kind of vibe, if you're into nice. like any of those. Um. I will say the only thing about this, and I hope it doesn't ruin it, is Nicolas Cage is very Nicolas Cage towards the end of this film. Um, <laughs> nearly to the point of, I'm not sure, I think another actor, and I don't ever usually say this, but I think another actor might have been better, potentially. He overcaged. Nick- he overcaged. He vampire kissed yeah. it. Nah, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to overcage. Exactly. Um, yeah. So those it's two, delicate I, balance. yeah, I absolutely loved. Third movie here, I'm going to go through some of these real quick. Death is all you need. I had to watch this because it was recommended to me for being so shit. It's an <laughs> Irish horror film. It looks like Fair City. Um, it's about these two people <laughs> looking for a song for unknown reasons. And they're going down the country and they're having all these older people sing them songs and bringing them back to this shady lady and reciting them for her. Um, and they eventually find this woman who sings a song for them, but the song is a curse. And it's just fucking bonkers, to be honest. <laughs> I'd nearly recommend it just out of if you're really into terrible, terrible films. I like a shit um, movie. Yeah. This is real bad though, man. <laughs> 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 this is literally fair city quality of levels of bad. But like, yeah, maybe if you just want a bit of a laugh, it's not long and just don't take it seriously at all and okay. you'll be fine. <laughs> um Return of the Living Dead is on Amazon Prime now as well. Um uh, I don't know if you know that it's like John Russo and um George Romero wrote Night of the Living Dead. Mm. And then they kind of they went their separate ways. George Romero went on to make Dawn of the Dead. Uh John Russo wanted to make a different kind of zombie film but Return of the Living Dead and if um you know the way you'll have that that trope with zombies being like brains. Yeah. That originates from this movie. That's okay. that's what made his zombies a bit different. They can cut, they could talk, and they kind of just they're 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 done slightly different. But this is like classic 80s um zombie horror, and it's it's silly, but it's it's a it's a favorite of mine. I absolutely Love adore it. it. And that hasn't been on any streaming services in so long. Um two two other movies, Blood Red Sky, <laughs> which is a fucking ridiculous movie. This is Netflix. It's uh what if terrorists took over and hijacked a plane only they didn't know a vampire was on board? Nice. That's your premise there. Nice. <laughs> I'm into it. I'm in. I'm so in. <laughs> but like, did they lean really hard? In? Like, did they get, I want to get hard. this motherfucking vampire off this motherfucking plane. 
Oh, you know, you're rooting for the vampire the entire time, man. Nice. <laughs> um, so that's it's it's uh it's actually not bad to be fair. It's it's um some of the fight scenes in it, some of the special effects in it are actually pretty good as well, and some of the um some of the acting is actually pretty decent as well in it, if I'm being honest. It's trash, but it's good trash. Um, and then the other one that I'd not seen in the cinema, but I, I saw it came to Netflix recently. Um, and I can't believe I didn't see this in the cinema because it was fucking brilliant. It was Smile. Oh, I haven't. I, I, I gave it a miss because it looked like shit horror. And I'm fundamentally and morally opposed to shit horror. But... I'm now hearing there's 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 almost a, a reclamation project to Smile where it's like no seriously this is actually good yeah Smile was brilliant okay really, I actually thought it was one that you'd seen already so I didn't mention it at the top they've but got yeah. a sequel in coming terms, out as well so I'm into mm, it in terms of like a modern horror um I thought it was great really really okay. good really well done it's really good effects as well and a fucking great ending really okay. really good ending. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch Smile now because I do, and I'll I'll watch the sequel as well, and we'll see if it if it holds up. I've got a recommendation for you, actually. This I, I know he's yeah yeah I know Ooh, okay. we said we're not going to talk about new releases in the cinema or anything, but this is one that I just while we're talking horror, I want to get you on this and as many people as possible. I'm gonna do a full review in the movie show at the end of the month. Um, but Kev, go see Speak No Evil. Okay, the, it's on my list. Yeah. The new James McAvoy movie, it is a remake of a Danish movie of the same name. Um, but they kind of go their own way here a little bit. Um, and James McAvoy, James McAvoy's the shit out of it. Um, <laughs> it, it is really fucking good. I went in expecting, it's Blumhouse, so I went in just expecting a Blumhouse kind of horror where I'm like, yeah, it's going to be fine, but it's probably going to be like just... It, there's potential here, but then it just goes over the top by the end and just gets too crazy and takes you out at a moment and everything they built up. And that's kind of what I expected because that's true of a lot of Blumhouse where it's like, um, you know, you were on the, the the road to a classic and then you just had to do the final third of the movie and you just took it too far and yeah. you, you shit on it. No, this stayed on the tracks the entire time and James McAvoy stayed on, made it stay on the tracks the entire time. It's a really well-told story. It is about anxiety. Like, because I love horror. I've written a couple of scripts and stuff like that as well. Never something I've done anything with, but I love horror that's about, that could happen. You know what I mean? I don't mind if you air into kind of, um, you know, sensational stuff and monsters like The Babadook, one of mm. my favorite movies ever. But The Babadook is a story about grief. The, the, the monster in that is grief. It's not like The Babadook could happen because The Babadook is a manifestation. And yeah. like kind of every, it, so I don't mind allegory and horror and so on. Uh, and then there being a sensationalistic side to it. But this is something that straight up could happen. Um, and it's based around a couple who make friends with another couple on holidays, uh, get invited to spend the weekend at the other couple's house. So they don't really know these people. And now they're in their home. And it's about little microaggressions. It's around anxiety. It's about can you trust strangers? It's about are you overthinking? Are you overreacting? It's about little boundary breaking moments and stuff like that. And it's just tension, tension, tension. And of course it goes fucking crazy. If you've seen the trailer, you kind of know which way. The trailer tips its hat. But you don't care because it still just works at every stage. And they build it and build it and build it until you can't bear it anymore. It's one of those where we're sitting in the theater, like, digging into my fucking seat the entire time <laughs> and not because anything was happening, but it was because like, there's one scene where it's like, they're getting into bed and they're like, is that an old stain? And I'm like, ah, ah, that's horror to me. <laughs> <laughs> I either have to sleep in their stain, not knowing if it's new or not, or I have to be rude. That's horror to me. That's psychological <laughs> horror. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's like a whole movie full of them that then goes crazy, but still manages to stay fun, interesting, and in keeping with the story that is told. It never goes too far. It never gets too crazy. It doesn't kind of get hyper and ruin everything. Um, 
Brilliant. Loved it. Um, I'm not going to turn around and say it's one of my favorites of all time, but I just went in with low expectations and I was like, you did it, guys. You did the thing. Uh, and again, just like repulsive. Like I was kind of just like, again, just spent so much of it just wiggling uncomfortably in my chair, which <laughs> only a few movies have done. Like Talk to Me did that to me. Um, and, and Long Legs did that to me as well. Only a few modern horror movies have done it to me, though. Um, but then there's other times where I'm just pissing myself laughing because it's so funny or because it's one of those where things are so tense you have to laugh because they've just mm. done it so well um and like it's james mcavoy again such an underrated actor we need to talk about james mcavoy more um yeah and he goes full james mcavoy in this and it's fucking brilliant go see speak no way but cannot recommend it enough um kev we did yes. the thing we talked about what we're watching that's yeah. what we came to do and that's what we did um kev it's been and now, a pleasure and now i have to go watch slow horses <laughs> you have to you have to watch slow horses i have to watch scavengers rain maybe a christmas uh, rings of power as well check it out trust me you'll love it that's yeah. something that you could say for christmas though uh, they've got lord of the rings war for their rohirrim but this won't spoil that and that won't spoil this like you can oh save that's the it. animated one that's out in december yeah. isn't it yeah, yeah, treat, yeah you can save this for whenever you like if you want to make lord it a christmas treat it would work a christmas yeah lord um, of the rings is a christmas thing to me so yeah, yeah. you can you can mm. it's something that you can say um anyway guys we will be back uh we don't have like a regular we're, we're literally just gonna go away and watch more and then we'll come back with recommendations when we have them so keep <laughs> tuned uh to that but kev we may uh catch up in a few weeks we may see if we can rope down in as well and talk agatha and uh the penguin with spoilers uh in into the spoiler verse so thanks as always for joining us before we go, uh, have you got into plug? And if you don't have into plug, you can just talk about something that you like or that you're you're listening to or that you're enjoying in general or you're reading. Um, um oh, I got to plug. I'm not really to plug at the moment. Um, just keep checking out Fan Club. We'd appreciate that. Um, oh yeah, just the Lonely Islands podcast. Actually, I'm a really big fan of that. If you've not watched any of that, no, or like listened to any of it, oh yeah. So they've got the podcast where they're going through all their SNL digital shorts with Seth Myers, and it's really fucking good. Okay, I, it's a big old recommend for me. Yeah, it's it's like thirty to forty minutes on a Monday, but it's a nice um, it's a nice podcast just for the bus or because it's not like really, it doesn't really take too much of your attention if you've had like a fucking long day in work you took that on it's really really good nice uh i'm started listening to bad friends uh have you ever listened to it andrew no. santino and bobby lee those names I mean, oh bobby lee, yes 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 uh very good and it is exactly what it says it is they're just they're two funny fuckers uh and they're terrible friends like andrew santino will get racist as fuck about asians in this and that's not the part that i enjoy but it's because bobby's right there and he makes bobby laugh because it's so funny um yeah yeah. they just are offensive they're just terrible they go for each other there's a whole sequence in it I got in it through TikTok clips where uh, they're like talking about happy Father's Day and then Andrew goes of course you can't celebrate Father's Day because your father is dead while mine is very much alive <laughs> and it's just, that's the tone <laughs> if you like dark sick you yeah. are bad friends check it out uh, but listen to us first and then listen to them uh, yeah. Kev Always a pleasure. Thanks for joining me on this venture. You Looking too, forward man. to chatting more. Next time on page 180, I'm going to be back next week uh, on this uh, with video now as well. We're going to have low blow shorts uh, also on the page 180 feed. Uh, I'm going to be breaking down whatever the hell is about to happen in the new Netflix Vince McMahon documentary. I'm going to watch it yes. all and I'm going to break it all down. Uh, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about because it totally depends on how whatever they do. Uh, but yeah, check that out anyway. I cannot wait. Uh, for Kev Keen, thanks so much for joining us. Follow Kev on socials. We're going to link to everything uh, in all the posts about it. Subscribe to us on socials if you haven't already. Uh, subscribe to us however you want to subscribe to us on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube, on uh, Apple TV or Apple. Not we're not on Apple TV. That'd be weird. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Randomly also starring an A-list actor. Samuel L. Jackson is joining us for the next episode. Uh, we're on Apple Podcasts or Amazon or Audible. However you want to subscribe to us, you can get us. But until next time, this has been Page 180. Oh, what the hell is this? Good cop, bad shit cop? <laughs>